is uh, indeed a pleasure and an honor to be here at the Dominican Republic to begin the process of introducing what I believe is a brand new discipline, indeed a brand new way of thinking to your country and other places in the world. One of the parts of future studies that I have come to appreciate and that I talk about in our program is that we are all part of history. We are the people who are descendants, will talk about, will learn about, will read about in their history classes. They will know us in a way that we do not know ourselves. They will figure out what we did, what we did not do, what we did well, and what we may have not done so well. And the process of understanding that while we still have time is one of the learnings that I believe that we have in future studies. It was 2,500 years ago when we invented the field of history as we know it. History, as you know, is the record of events and, and people and happenings in past times. But it was not always that. It used to be simply the myths and the legends, the stories, the ideas that people were sharing with each other to try and create morality and common spirit. Really what happened was not so important. But a general in the Greek civilization named Thucydides, a general who had just fought in one of the most important wars, decided to write down exactly what happened. Not just the lessons, not just the myths and the legends. He didn't have the gods and the spirits intervening in the affairs of men. Rather, he wrote down what happened. Well, that seemed obvious to us, but it was a revolution in thought in those particular days. And so I believe that we may be doing somewhat similar things today in introducing a new way of thinking, a way of thinking that has grown over the last 40 or 50 years to become what we believe is a more productive, more systematic, and ultimately more effective way of thinking about the future. Of course, we all think about the future, short term, long term. We think about what we're going to do tomorrow, what we're going to do over the weekend. We think about our vacation that we may take at Christmas. We think about the next course we may take or a business investment. We, of course, think about our children and their success and, and our grandchildren and how they will live in the, in the long term future. So we think about the future all the time just as the people of the past thought about the past all the time. But I'm going to propose this evening a new way of thinking about the future, a somewhat radical way of thinking about the future that we believe in Houston and throughout the futures community will be something that we recommend to the center here at Fung Gold and indeed to the educational systems and to the government systems throughout the Dominican Republic. Before I get to those radical concepts, though, let me tell you a little bit about change. You know, it's ironic that we talk about change so much. We are, we are swimming in a sea of change. The media every day treats us to the changes that are going on in the world, both little and, and large. But we have never learned about change in school. At least I didn't. And I took a degree in sociology. And the word change rarely came up. Certainly the word future never did. So what I'd like to do to begin with is just a little lesson, and the people here who have been in the class know, know what I'm going to say, but, uh, and they can help me as we go along. There are two kinds of change, two forces that create change in the future. The world goes about its changes, and we create change as well. We call the first inbound change because it comes at us, it comes towards us. And the second we call outbound change because we act on the world. And our future is always, always, always a combination of what the world does and what we do. 
Sometimes the world's influence is larger than ours. Sometimes our influence is quite large. But every single part of the future is a function of what the world does and what we do. So if we are going to understand the future, we have to understand both what the world is doing in its changing and what we can do to create a more pre preferable future. That's one distinction that we want to keep in mind, and I'll use it in my talk later on. A second distinction, which is extremely important, is how fast change occurs. The changes, a lot of the changes that we talk about, like economic growth or the growth of population or the warming of the planet, take a very long period of time. It's what we call continuous change or incremental change. And frankly, we're pretty good at dealing with that. It happens all the time, we're used to it, and most importantly, we have lots of time to get ready and to adapt for those changes because they take so long. The changes we do not have time for are called discontinuous changes, disruptions. They occur suddenly and, and, and they come at us in a surprising way. And we're surprised, and when we're surprised, we're at risk. And when we're at risk, we make mistakes, and we do not use that time as well as we can. If you put continuous and discontinuous change together, we think of, the, we think of change, past, present, and future, as a series of episodes, a series of chapters. In history, they call them eras. An era is a period of time that has a certain degree of consistency and coherence. The Depression was an era. The Cold War was an era. The Renaissance was an era. And you've had many eras in the history of your own country. What we forget, I'm going to go ahead anyway. They tell me to do this. I have to tell you, once I gave, I gave a talk in a hotel in Denver, Colorado many years ago. It was during a blinding snowstorm. And, and this was in a big ballroom in the center of the hotel, no windows. And all the lights went out. And just like this, I kind of paused, and a guy from the back of the room said, keep going. <laughs> so I kept talking in the dark. It was, <laughs> it was the only speech I've ever given in the dark. Oh, now we have a microphone. Hold on. Now, I, <laughs> now, I need to, now I need to talk a little more gently. But there's a, there's a feedback. Hello. <laughs> can you hear me in the back without the microphone? We can, we can turn the microphone off. Our guy back there may need it. I don't know. Oh, now the light's back on. I guess I go. All right, so we forget that we're in an era today. The era we live in today, as I said, historians will tell our children what the name was. And we will know really what this era was about, as we know the previous eras. But era is an extremely important concept in this new way of thinking about the future. And I'll explain about that in just a moment. Two things we need to do in the future. One is to understand the world and how it's changing. And the other is to act to create a more preferable future. So let me talk about the world first of all. And my first radical statement, you do not have to be able to predict the future in order to prepare for it. You don't have to be able to predict and you can prepare any way. The reason is that you can't predict. It's impossible, so don't expect to do the impossible. Don't do something that you're always going to do wrong. My gosh, how foolish is that? But when most people realize that they can't predict the future, then they stop paying attention. They stop looking. They stop trying to understand. We have a middle ground, and with that middle ground we call anticipation. It's getting ready for the future even though we don't know exactly what it will be. This tennis player waiting for the serve is in, that fo is in that state of anticipation. They don't know which end it's going to come, which side it's going to come, but they're ready for the serve nevertheless. Children on Christmas morning, anticipation, waiting. The bride on a wedding day, the naval cadet about to graduate, wants that first assignment. They can't wait for the future to happen. They're ready. They're going for it. How different that is from our normal concept of change. Oh my gosh, here comes change. I'm afraid. I'm concerned. I don't want it to happen. No, we recommend that people anticipate change because every change is the possibility of novelty 
It's an opportunity to do what we want to do even better, even though we can't predict what is going to happen. We can prepare for the change nevertheless. And that's what, what, that's what this center will learn how to do and teach the other people in the country how to do, how to prepare for change that is unpredictable and indeed unexpected. The second radical statement that I will make is that the future is not a single thing, it is many things. The future is a set of possibilities, not one particular uh, future. The difference is that we are not, a, we all know that the, there are many possibilities in the future, but we believe that we have to be able to pick out the future before we can do anything about it. And as I said before, that's impossible and therefore don't do it. Leave all the futures on the table. Prepare for the major differences in change, even though many of them may not occur. It's a, it's a new concept. It's not to discount all the other futures. No para de ninguno de los futuros. Allow us to prepare for all of the major futures, not just one. In English, at least, we use the words, the future will happen, the future should happen. Those are very strong words, and those are the words that people use who want to win the argument, who want to say, this is what's going to happen, and we have to prepare for it. But of course, the other side says, oh no, that's not going to happen. This other thing is going to happen. We have to prepare for that. And they disagree, and they argue, and there's a conflict over the future. And one side wins, and all the other sides lose. And you prepare for the future of the winner, but you don't prepare for the futures of the losers. And what happens? One of those other futures happens instead. That's a tragedy. We, need, we have to go right to the core of our language and, and stop that conflict of ideas from the very beginning because if the future is multiple, if there are many futures, not one, then everyone's plausible future should be considered as we prepare for the future. If a group is, is optimistic, that's a possible future. If a group is pessimistic, that's a possible future. And we ought not to tell either group that they are wrong because we do not know what the future will be. In that case, we prepare for both. Now, we do have to make decisions. And we do have to act. And sometimes the, what future we are, are preparing for is important in that. And sometimes we have to decide, but not always, and not always, not too soon. In future studies, we tell stories about the future. We don't make predictions. We're in the process of telling stories about the future. We call them scenarios. A scenario is not a prediction. It's not saying that it will happen, but we are saying that it could happen. And if it does happen, what are we going to do about it? So in our decisions and in our plans, we make decisions and we make plans not guaranteeing or counting on one future occurring, but all the futures occurring. And if they all occur, if one of them occurs, we're ready anyway. It's, this is not like baseball. It's not like batting average. It's not like how often were you right and how often were you wrong. The question is, were you prepared when any of those futures occurred? That's the purpose. It's not to be right. Yesterday, I described the venture capital industry. If any of you here are in, in venture capital investments, their batting average is terrible. In Silicon Valley, venture capitalists make investments. Eight out of 10 of them make no money whatsoever. That's only 0.2. One of them breaks even, and one makes a lot of money. You wouldn't get into the major leagues with a 0.2 batting average. But they're making a lot of money. They're being very successful. So the purpose is not to be right about the future. The purpose is to be prepared. I use a lot of times, I use insurance as an example. Are you going to predict the year in which your house is going to burn down before you buy insurance? Well, of course not. Our house doesn't burn down at the end of the year. We don't go, ah, I was wrong again. Isn't it too bad? I'm never any good at this prediction. 
when we buy the insurance the next year anyway. So we're looking at all kinds of possibilities in the future, a new way of thinking about the future. It is not necessary to predict. It is necessary to be ready. And what is the, what is the, the process of being ready? The process of being ready, people who are not ready are those who are stuck in the present. If we are an era, we know that all eras come to an end. Our era will come to an end. There will be a discontinuity that comes, maybe soon, maybe late, maybe never for us, but for maybe for our children, in which this era comes to an end and a new era starts. Nothing goes on forever. So one thing I say is that the future is a temporary condition. Few, the present is temporary. The present is a way of working out what there is today. And if we realize that the present is temporary, then we don't hold on to it with the same vigor that people who think that it's permanent. The longer our era goes on, the more we confuse this era and its characteristics with reality. It's not reality. It's this era, which is changeable, and it will change. So people who are ready for the future are those who enjoy the current era, use the current era, are successful in the current era, but they're ready to move on when the discontinuity occurs and the new era comes. They are the first people into the new era using that and enjoying that and being ready for that. The other thing we have to get out of, and the people who prepare for the future, is to prepare for futures that are unexpected. Most people know the future will be different, more computers, more people, more environmental problems. All those things are expected, and those, many of those things will occur. But some things will occur that are not expected. And in that process, that's where the scenarios come in. So it's not only to get out of the present and to get our mindset that there will be change, fundamental change, but to get our mindset that the change we expect may not be the change that we experience. So to experience all of the different scenarios. So why do we tell stories? We tell stories to hit people with the concept that there is change happening in their life and that that change could be unexpected. We want people to walk away from a scenario, whether it's in a story or a movie or a poem or a graphic or something like that, saying, my gosh, things could really be different. And we better get ready for that. Perhaps the most successful use of scenarios in, the, in history were the scenarios created in South Africa while the country was deciding its course after apartheid. Members of the Shell Oil Corporation created four scenarios, and, and some of them were awful, and some of them were okay, and some of them were quite good. We know the, the history there. We know what happened a transition, a bloodless transition, from one form of government to another, partially because people considered the alternatives. People did not want that to happen. So this center, as I talk about, will be looking out for what is changing in the world. It will be using both its logical analysis, which we need to use, but also its tremendous imagination. What could happen instead? Where's the brand new novelty? Where are things that we don't expect to happen going to come from? And even if they get most of those wrong, even if they get all of them wrong, it's still a worthwhile exercise because we are getting out of the present and we are getting out of the expected future. I tell people that multiple scenarios are not just multiple predictions. Multiple scenarios are intellectual exercise. We're exercising the muscle in our brain to begin to prepare for an unexpected future. It's very much like jogging. You know, we don't confuse jogging with transportation. It doesn't get us anywhere. We end up exactly where we started. And you say, well, that's silly. You're just sweating, and you just did all this energy and all that, and you're right where you started. No, it's conditioning. We do it to get in condition to become healthy. So we do scenarios not to try and hit the bullseye, but to get in condition to think about change and think about it in unexpected ways. 
So the center here at Von Gold is going to be, I hope, a leading institution in introducing this radical kind of thinking. You don't have to predict to prepare, and you don't have to be right to, be, to use the future and the changes coming uh, in any kind of a useful way. That's inbound change. And I, and I know because Yurima just gave all, you know, what she learned in, there in her introduction, she knows all this stuff, and so do the people who took the course this week. Let me turn then to the other half of future studies. We ourselves are influential in preparing, creating the future. More radical concepts. Leaders are those who promote a new era. When we think of a new era, as I said, that oftentimes makes us anxious. We're concerned. My gosh, I don't want to leave the old era. The old era was good to me. I don't want to have to enter into this new world. And here we have leaders, people, who stand up and say it is time to leave the old era and start the new. It's not something that happens to them. It's something that they create on purpose on their own. Whether you're religious or not, the story of the Exodus in the Bible is an excellent story of this kind of leadership. Moses, a reluctant leader if there ever was one, not a person who aspired to greatness particularly, felt, however, that it was time to leave Egypt and head off to the land that was promised him. But what did they have to do in between time? Go through the desert, and the desert was not a happy place to be. And yet, they ended up in the visionary future. Leaders are those who promote a new era. Believe it or not, leaders do not have to be authorities. Authorities are people in charge of things. They're presidents and CEOs and generals and teachers and police officers and all of those things in their domain. They are authority. When they say, this is the way it is, then we have to go along with them. When the police officer says, get out of the car, you get out of the car. When the general says, it's time to move the tanks over here, you move the tanks over there. They're authorities. They may be leaders, but they may not be. And they do not have to be. And there are many people in this country and in this world who are leaders, who are promoting a new era, they have no authority whatsoever. So I draw a distinction. I don't call the presidents and the CEOs and the generals leaders unless they really are promoting a new era. They are authorities. They make decisions. Good that they do. And they can do that well. They don't have to be leaders. But if they aspire to create a new era, then they will be those kind of leaders. The description of that new era is the concept of a vision. A vision is a seeing. It's a seeing of how things could be that is radically different, that is a discontinuous change from how they have been. The leaders that we celebrate in your history and mine all were people who said this can be fundamentally different and better. And what is their job? to articulate that vision, to describe that as Moses described the land of milk and honey, as Abraham Lincoln described a free people, an emancipated people, as Martin Luther King Jr. described his dream of people who were judged on the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. All of these leaders were saying, I have a vision and we will work together to promote that vision. So what do leaders do? They articulate the vision, and they enroll people. They sign people up into a campaign to create the visionary future, to lead them into the new era. Enrollment. Enrollment is, is a persuasion. It's very much like a political campaign, getting people on board by saying, let's do this together. So leaders have to be visionary. They have to be able to see possibilities that very few other people see. But is that new era going to come about very soon? If it's substantial, not at all. It will take a very, very long time. So they also have to be persistent. Can they do it by themselves? Hardly ever. So they have to be collaborative. And most of all, leadership, as we know, is a dangerous occupation. Many of the leaders in history were literally martyrs for the new eras that they promoted. And in that sense, 
a leader has to be courageous. First of all, simply to stand up in the midst of, a, of, a, of, a, of an unknowing population who be begins to think of them as ridiculous almost or as somehow deranged and say, no, I am serious. We can create a new era here and now if you help me, if you enroll with me in this campaign. So leaders don't have to be managers. They don't even have to be great speakers. They have to be committed to, uh, to work for and promote the new era, committed enough so that other people will sign up. They will enroll in the campaign. Without that, they're, they're obviously impossible. If you don't have to have authority, what do you have to have? You have to have a vision. You have to have the courage. But every one of us has what we call a sphere of influence, a sphere. A sphere is a large, round object. And within that sphere of influence, we have influence over the people and the things in that sphere. It may be a relatively small sphere, like our family or our work group or our classes. It may be a larger sphere, like a big organization or a government agency or the president's sphere, which is the whole country and indeed other countries in the Caribbean. No matter how the size, each of us has a sphere of influence that we can use to create a brand new era. I told the story of my, in my class of my favorite leader, my favorite hero. It's a guy named Bruce Renfro. Bruce in the 1990s drove an elevator in New York City. The elevator had two floors, the subway and the street. It was in the subway system. And he took that elevator and he created a new era of an elevator. An elevator, no authority whatsoever. He brought in some plants, he hung pictures, he introduced himself to people. Every day people would come. These were people going to work, coming home from work. So there were regular people and he introduced themselves. He introduced them to each other. Here are people in New York City going to work. You talk about a tough crowd. A crowd is really hard to convince and they said it was the best 20 seconds of their day. So here's a guy who has sphere of influence is tiny. It's one elevator. And yet he transformed it into something where people said, wow, how did you do that? This is amazing. This is marvelous. I believe that a lot of us have the potential to use our sphere of influence and to transform our sphere of influence into a new era, to create discontinuous change on purpose, not wait for it to happen to us from the world. And that's what leaders do, and that's what leadership here in Dominican Republic has the possibility of doing. I do have one caution, however. As I said, leadership is difficult, takes a long time, it requires courage and skill. And I ask people not to start to become a leader until they believe that they can actually finish it. It will be twice as long, three times as expensive, and at least ten times as difficult. How many people have we heard say, who accomplished great things, if I had known how difficult it was going to be, I probably would not have started. So it requires that deep down commitment, not just for a month or two or a year or a couple, but I am going to stay with this until we are at the visionary era. And people will know that. They can read that and they can sense that. And that's what the enrollment is. How many times have we been treated to leaders who say, oh, we're going to do this great thing, and oh, we're going to do this great thing, and three months later, oh, we're not now? How many times have we been disappointed? So the very first thing that a leader confronts is the cynicism and the skepticism. Are you for real? Or are you like all those others who said great things but didn't really follow through? So don't start unless you intend to finish. But if you have that vision, if you want to do something and leave a mark on your world, on your sphere of influence, and really who doesn't? We all want to be important in our world. We all want to make a contribution. We all want when we leave our job or our community or our family, somebody says, wow, that person really made a substantial change. That's everybody's aspiration. And I think a lot of us could do that if we had the encouragement and the training and the skill to be able to do so. And that's what Future Studies is also about. So let me wind up with a few, a review of the radical statements 
that this new way of thinking about the future is going to promote. The future, every single future, is a combination of what the world does, what we have to pay attention, and what we do. The future and the flow of change is not continuous. It is continuous for a while, but it's broken up into episodes. The world, once in a while, creates new episodes by creating discontinuous change. The appearance of the Internet, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the attacks of 9-11, the collapse of the credit system. All of these are discontinuous changes in the world that created new eras that we're all having to deal with. On the other hand, we also can create new eras. We can all start the process of creating a discontinuous change within our sphere of influence. We can't predict what the discontinuous changes and the new eras the world will bring, nor when they will, but we can use our imagination to think about how it could be, not how it will be. We can tell stories to each other, what if stories, what if this and what if that, and somebody can say, I don't think that's going to happen, and you're allowed to say, you know, I don't think it's going to either, but what if it does? What if the house does burn down this year and we don't have insurance? We should be thinking about preparing for those changes. And most of all, we want to empower people to use the leadership opportunities that they have, to enroll other people in the creation of a new era on purpose, not just waiting for the world to do that for us. I believe that there's a human spirit in, in all of us that really wants to make a difference. We want that for our children, for our colleagues, for our communities, for our firms and our government agencies. We want somebody to say, that person really made a difference, and the way to make a difference is to create a long-term discontinuous change, to indeed introduce a new era. So my recommendation for the center here at Fungold is that it has four tasks, four elements of its mission. The first task is to be the lookout. You know, you think of the lookout on the, on the ships of old, the lookout who, who could see over the horizon because they were so high up off the water. I can think of a lookout on a mountain here in the Dominican Republic, looking out on the sea and telling the people in the village when the ships are coming or when the storm is approaching. So people look here to the future center at Fungold to say, what's happening out there? You're the first people who, who know about that. You're in touch with that large, large world, and we need to listen to you to tell us what is coming in that world and what scenarios could actually happen. A second task that I would recommend is to develop leaders, encouraging them, identify their sphere of influence, to articulate their dreams, to give them the skill to describe those dreams and enroll other people in the process. Not to take unnecessary risk because big time leadership is dangerous, but everybody ought to have some strategic goal that they're working for, for themselves or for their family or for their community or for their job. I encourage people in all organizations to go around and say, what are you doing? Well, I'm you know, filling out these forms, or I'm answering the telephone, or I'm paying these bills. Yeah, you're doing that too, and you've got to do that to keep your job. But what difference are you making? Where, where, where is somebody going to say when you leave, that was a substantial contribution? What change, what new era have you created? I think when, when everybody in an organization has that kind of a strategic goal, then everybody is working together to create a more preferable future. A third task, then, is to create plans. General Eisenhower, before the invasions of Normandy, made a fundamental statement. He said, plans are useless, but planning is essential. Once the action starts, the plan changes. We know that. It, you can't just follow it like you can follow a blueprint if you're building a house or building a bridge. But the process of planning, the process of bringing people together over strategic goals, who's going to do what, what needs to happen, how are we going to, we all agree, we understand, and we commit to do what is necessary to achieve the outcomes of the plan. These are not big, long documents. They're basically contracts between people saying, yes, we're going to do something together, and let's go do it. 
that's what real planning is. It's not a complicated thing. It's an agreement to understand and to move out in a particular direction. And the last job then, of course, is to take action, to act on behalf of the country, act on behalf of the people for all of those goals which we support, for the goals of education and a clean environment, for the goals of a meaningful job and a, and a worthwhile job for everyone, for education for our children, because action is what it's all about. Action is creating and taking that preferred future. So if there is a center here acting as a lookout, as a source of leaders, as a creator of plans and a taker of action would be a tremendous mission and a tremendous contribution that this organization could make to the future of this country. Every, the future of this country is a combination of what the world will do and what its people will do. It is not just the world and it is not just the people. It is a combination of both. I described it to someone the other day as a dance. We have to dance with the world and find out where the world is, and we also have to lead the world towards a more preferable future. We have a master's degree at the University of Houston, which actually teaches and prepares professional futurists. We're one of only two or three or a dozen or so in the whole world that is teaching this subject. It is yet the very, very earliest period of this discipline, which I hope 100 years from now, 200 years from now, every school ch child will learn fundamentally how to think about the future, how to anticipate the future, and most importantly, how to influence the future for themselves, their families, their communities, and the nation as a whole. It's really a tremendous privilege and an honor to be able to share these thoughts with you and enroll you in the campaign of bringing foresight and future studies the Dominican Republic through the center here at Fungold. I thank you very much.